Okay, I'm going to start sharing. Um, we're going to be talking about dismantling evolution. Uh, it's it's a part of a series that uh, Mr. Johnny told us about earlier, and I want uh, I really want people to understand that this is an important topic. Um, I, I think most of us have an idea. It is you're listening, you're tuned in, but uh, when we start uh, talking about apes and man, it's really discrediting what God has created. And so that's why I, uh, I, I speak on this earnestly. It's my heart, it's, my, it's what it's all about as far as his ministry, it's a real, real big concern. So uh, dismantling evolution from ape to man is where we're gonna begin. And as we talk, I just wanted to, as Johnny mentioned, there is resources that go along with this presentation. We've been talking about dismantling evolution. It's a three-part series. This video, this DVD, has a, many of the things that I'm talking about. It, it has the same kind of concepts. I have a, maybe I'm going a little more detail in some, certain areas. It might go a little more detail in others, but it's an excellent, excellent resource. If you don't have it, I would really recommend you get it. It's, it's excellent. Uh, and by the way, it's, it's, it's done in a nice way. It's done in a way that I think is very friendly uh, for those who are not very scientific. It's friendly enough that you understand what's going on. The other thing I want you to be aware of is the book, Fatal Fruit, Evolution's Fatal Fruit. One of the things that you're gonna see today as I discuss the, these topics, I believe Darwin was the impetus, uh, the strongest tool to bring in the ape man theory and bring it into a point where racism became uh, important too. It's, a, it's an issue that we're facing today. And I believe that the theory of evolution by Darwin had a lot to do with this. So please uh, pay attention to that, it's important. The book relates to this. It talks about the idea that uh, who Darwin was and the fact that Darwin literally with his ideas became dangerous. It brought death to millions and that's kind of what the theme is, and, it, and I, it, no, I'd like to add more to this, <laughs> but it's a good show. I wrote it in 2006, and I'm going to be referring to it. And as Johnny mentioned, uh, or we're going to mention, I, I was talking earlier about the Ice Age creatures from the past. That's going to be uh, April 30th this year, 2021, and that's a Friday. We always do the fellowships, and we'll continue to do this on the last Friday of the month. And uh, I'm doing them now, but we'll probably bring speakers in later on. And you know, we can share information and so on, but it's gonna be a, a point where you can depend upon CSI being there uh, the last Friday of the month. And with Zoom, we can do this. And as I mentioned earlier, as we were talking uh, that our ministry is to reach the world of truth of creation. And this is a wonderful way to do it. Uh, so the idea of the ice age is gonna be focused on the creatures, because they roam the earth. And you might not know what all these creatures are. I'm going to introduce them to you. Uh, they're not alive today. Uh, and we're going to show you the fossils. And we're going to show you how the Bible speaks about an ice age. So uh, we'll be answering a lot of questions. And we hope you join us. So tonight's topic uh, is the first topic. We Well, the dismantling evolution. The first topic, dismantling evolution, we did the uh, from the beginning. So we did evolution from the beginning. And that was kind of a, a talk where we, we, we brought it. It's, it's recorded so you can take a look at it. But it's a talk that centers on the fact that we uh, evolutionists believe that everything came by mistake, by chance. And that's both life and it's also in the big cosmos, including the stars, the galaxies, and so on. And we introduce the fact that the mechanism for this is, is basically by chance, it's naturalism, it's founded on naturalism. Evolution is founded on natural principles. And that's where everything comes from. If you ask for a mechanism for naturalism, they will say every time it's by chance, okay? And that's against any logical reasoning. So we mentioned that in the first discussion and it's, it's online and you can take a look at it. The second one, uh, we dealt with from evolution from molecules, uh, from, from the molecules on up, showing that life is intricate 
it's extremely, extremely intricate. And when you think of life, you have to think of unbelievable things working all together in harmony, like systems and tiny machines, molecular machines, all working together to accomplish one thing, to accomplish the purpose of life. So when God says, I am the life and the way, he is the life. He ordained this. He gave everything, the life, the spirit that exists today. So our life, the living things around us is God ordained. And it's simply written in the molecules. It's written all over. It's just like the cosmos. His name is written. Isaac Newton said, look, look at the Look, there's a, there's a watchmaker out there. He designed everything. He put everything in place. Same thing for the living organisms, the things all around us. And of course, today we're going to be speaking about the ape to man myth. Now, I always use this as kind of a theme for dismantling evolution. Are you confused? How did I get here? Where did everything come from? It's important that you keep that in mind because I want to tell you, when it comes to looking in terms of where, where we are and what we're doing, um, whether it be an atheist or whether it be a Christian, those are important questions. And so the, where, where, who am I? Where did I come from? Those are essential questions that I believe we need to have answers for. And we need to be able to talk to others about because our burden should always be ready to have the gospel, uh, our tips in our mouth to let God, mercy, and graciousness uh, be known. And that's, that's what this is all about. That's what our ministry is all about. So dismantling evolution from ape to man myth that's what we're going to be talking about dismantling it so let's begin um i thought that um, a good beginning is to tell you that my wife in this picture is the gorilla now you might have to think about that i didn't marry a gorilla no no but she's in a costume that I had to beg her to wear. <laughs> the first the fellow that was supposed to show up never showed up. So boy, did I have a lot to pay for that one. <laughs> but she's in the costume. So I always like to show you, and I love the title, Is Evolution Making a Monkey of You Out of You? And I, I love that because that's that's really what we're talking about. So it's a big choice. What's a big choice? Where uh, where do we come from? Okay. Do we come from that guy? Or did we come from a uh, monkey or uh, as evolution suggests, or do we come from, uh, was I created by a sovereign almighty God? That's the big question. Now, I believe that most of us here, I'm not, uh, you know, I, I could be speaking to an atheist or agnostic, I don't know. But uh, my logic and my reason as a logical man who likes to look at life Yes, I have faith in God, but I have a faith and a rational faith that God exists. And it, 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 he's a rational, supernatural being that trans, has transformed himself into a man, created us in his image, so we can have a relationship with him. So it makes sense to me that he gave us that intelligence, that rationale, so we can reason this out. Most people from the very beginning, when they're very little, little kids, know that there's a creator, there's a God. It takes education, that takes higher education in particular, to tell you that there's no God and evolution is true. This, this is a fact, we see this all the time. It's supported by the data that we, we see. Now, the point here is, oh, I'm sorry, I let the monkey in. He's, he might be coming in every so often, so be careful. Uh, I love this one. Common origin or common creator. There's a commonness, you see, a uniqueness, but there is something the same. And so God has created animals with appendages like us. They have, they have hands, they have legs. I mean, not like ours, but, you know, we're kind of all kind of following an anatomy, a plan, an architecture that was put out by, I believe, the creator God, intelligent, almighty. And we see this design being uh, used throughout God's creation. So we have a monkey, 
Okay. Well, here he is again. I'm sorry. Got the monkey stuck in there. I don't know. Okay. Or man. So, um, you know, I, I look at it this way. The scripture tells me clearly, and we'll start off there because that's where I believe we need to start off. The reason why I start off with scripture is because I understand that I'm finite and so is science. And science is not perfect because it's made of man. So where do we find everlasting truth? It's a belief that I have, and that belief is the word of God. In Genesis 1, 26, it says, then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heaven, of the, uh, of the heavens and over the livestock and, all, and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his image, uh, in his own image, in the image of God, he created him male and female, he created them. So God literally created us in his image. And I, I like the idea of repeating words. So the word created, the word image appears three times in the scripture in these two verses, image and created. So God uses these words repetitively as we translate, as translate, translates them to us, they're significant to us. Created out of nothing in what? In God's image. And of course, we, it tells us we have dominion over the earth. So that's our command from God. We have a purpose. We see that. We also see in Psalm 8, 4, 6, that we have a special position in God's creation. What is man that you are mindful of him? The son of man that you care for him. You have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put things under his feet. As we read in Genesis 126 and also in Genesis 128, we see that everything, earth, is our, we manage that. God has given that as a gift. So we take this seriously. And we praise God that he's given us this unbelievable position. As it, David says, it's a position of honor and glory. That's God's ordination. So as we begin this topic, I want to make sure that's in front of us. Because we're going to see what man has done and how he's taken his image and brought it down. That special God's creation that created us so we can have a relationship with him. They want to take us down. And so I wanted to begin the beginning of, of this idea of the eight man myth. And I believe it started with Charles Darwin. Now you might look at this picture here that I put before you. Um, that's Jenny. And Jenny is all dressed up. That's a cartoon of Jenny. Now, I take that seriously, because I'm going to discuss that with you. Darwin spent many, many hours studying Jenny in the London Zoo. So beware of that. Also, uh, we found at the American Museum of Natural History, I said we found, Pastor Steve is, was with me. We might, we'll talk a little bit about it. But we made a voyage in 2006 to go and join the people who were honoring Darwin. We just were spectators. We were not honoring, they considered him their God. <laughs> we found that out as we went there, as they were celebrating Darwin's birthday in 2006, and the 100 years publication, and also the um, 150 years, I believe, of his birthday. So they were, they were broadcasting to the whole world that, hey, uh, this is Darwin, and we have to honor him because he's he's a great man. So we went to the American Museum of Natural History, where the first one of the first exhibits started. And so uh, for 21 years, he kept his, his theory a secret. That was the Darwin exhibit, which Steve and I. By the way, that last picture was of the subway. I'll go back here for a second. That's a subway. <laughs> uh, that's how we got to the museum, and we went through the subway. And you can go through the subway. You could drive up and near Central Park and you get out, that's the easiest way to go if you live in the city. You get it, the subway, and you just walk right in. So uh, here we are at the museum. 
This is where I wrote the book, Evolution's Fatal Fruit. That's where it began with going through that exhibit and seeing what Darwin was. So he, what kind of science did Darwin practice? I believe he practiced good science. He was a good uh, observer. He collected a lot of things. Now I said he was a good science scientist in a way that he was making observations, collecting data. That's good science. But his hypothesis, his ideas were really crazy. They were godly, they were unrighteous, and they were un, uh, not logical at all. So I want to make sure that's clear. See, I believe in rationale because God has given that rationale. We're created in his image. But humans can use that rationale in a different way. They turn it around and become illogical. So uh, Darwin, before Darwin's time, this was in the museum. This was a one of the, you know, they had a picture and they had sayings underneath those pictures. So this is one of the sayings I caught. This is from the exhibit in 2006. Before Darwin's time, humans were not considered part of the natural world. People saw that they resembled other animals, especially other primates, like the orangutan and like the chimpanzee, still despite the undeniable similarities between us and them, only a handful of early naturalists classified humans too as animals. Now, when Steve and I went through that, we knew it was all a setup. I mean, it was biased towards what they believed in. Uh, and they were just trying to say in so many words that we were dumb at that time. We didn't know any better, but because of Darwin, we know. So how did this idea of apes to man come to be? Now, I know it's been hanging around. I mean, you could look at the Greeks, you could look at all, you, it's been hanging around, but because Darwin made such a impact with his evolution, I believe that with his tree of life that he put down, he, he wrote this in his notebook. He was a copious writer and he wrote lots of notes. This is the, tree of life where everything is connected and where the monkey is connected to the man and where the monkey is connected to another mammal and so on. And so that's what he thought, this continuous life, this tree of life that would continue to grow and grow. Now, of course, with that kind of idea, and he, by the way, uh, I wish I was there. <laughs> this is where Darwin thought the idea up. It's in London. He lived in London from 1809 to 1882. That's where he came up with that idea. That's where he spent a lot of time watching Jenny, his monkey. So we see that Darwin spent many hours observing an orangutan named Jenny in London Zoo in 1838. It was fascinating and stated it seemed to display emotions in the same manner as a human child. This is in his notes. So he started to look at this Jenny and he was fascinated with her. He thought that there was a connection and that's why he spent so much time there. So it, he, he was writing notes, putting lo lots of notes together. And in 1859, in the origin of the spe species, he never mentioned the monkey, the monkey link, uh, link to man, the ape link to man. He never mentioned that. He just kept, he wanted to make sure that evolution was set. He said in his, in his, in his diaries and his writings, he said there was too much. He had to save it for another publication. So in 1859, he came out with the origins of species, preservation of favored races, and the struggle for life. And no other book except for the Bible has influenced the world since then. And I say this because when we look at races and when we look at what's going on here with eight man thing, this is what I'm, I'm seeing right here, that Darwin had a lot to do with it. You see, years later in, 19, in 1871, he published The Descent of Man. Uh, he, he looked at it and again, this was a, he came up with the idea. Remember he was in London? I just showed you the, the 1838, 1837, convinced that species were mutable productions. I could not avoid to believe that man must come under the same law in his tree. It had to be somewhere that man was higher and the monkey was right below it, okay? So in, this is the, his book, The Scent of Man, and what his purpose was, he was, I've read that book, I made lots of notes on it. He was, he, was, he was determined 
to make the connection. And he failed. He failed miserably. But it sounded good. And a lot of people took on to it. So uh, the descent of man, 1871, Darwin stated the Negro and the gorilla were on the same evolutionary level between man and the baboon. So you get an idea of what we're talking about. We get this connection that, hey, we got branches of the tree. Okay, there's a baboon. There, oh, where, where do we fit? We need a transitional go between there. So where did he just put the African Negro right there, right in the middle? So now you're getting the idea where we got this, I, this, this, this thing about, uh, oh, you know, maybe he's a subspecies. Maybe he's not as good as man. He belongs under it. So that's how we start this racist kind of idea. Darwin taught that when it left itself, natural selection would accomplish extinction without slavery to embrace and protect them. Or so it was thought. Blacks would have to complete with Caucasian, compete with Caucasian for survival. When the greater fitness for this contest was, they believed, beyond dispute, they, they, uh, the disappearance of Blacks as a race then would only be a matter of time. Now, you have to understand, this was part of the theory that Blacks would not sustain themselves. And so the, you're going to see a, a eugenics movement come out of this because, the, you know, under, but anyway, Dar, 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 Darwin's disciples, Thomas Huxley, uh, Darwin's bulldog made the state statements. He made the statement, Thomas Huxley, scientific racism introduced no rational man cognizant by the facts believed that the average Negro is equal, still less than the superior of the white man. That's his own words. He wrote a book called Evidence as to Man's Place in Nature. And he hired, this is in 1859 after Darwin published his book. He came in and published his own book and more magically assumed that Darwin was talking about the eight man uh, connection. Along with another disciple is uh, Ernest Heckel. He published a, a book called The History of Creation. And in his book, he drew these pictures. He was an artist. And you notice how he drew them. As you, you could see clearly that this, these pictures here demote monkey to man. But look what's in between. You see right in the middle, there's that black African. So we get to see now the formation of racism. It was being promoted right then and there. And we know about Germany. Ernest Heckel died in 19, after 1911. We know that they were becoming a, very, uh, a nation very independent. They had intellectuals that thought of the idea of evolution. And, the, and I made this connection in my book that evolution is a con connected to Hitler, which you're going to see in a second. Madison Grant, the passing of the great race. He talked about the Aryan race, the Alpine race. The Germans got the idea of the Aryan race because this was part of the research Grant produced. He, he produced that. And actually, when Hitler grabbed his book, the Nazis, when they first came into power, ordered the book to be translated and reprinted, the mass, the mass, the passing of the great race by Madison Grant. Yes, an English author. He was, he was a, a, a lawyer and was a promotion of the American Museum of Natural History, right? The museum where we visited, he was there. It was, he was the, one of the starters of the museum in 1900. He had a lot to do with the exhibits. Uh, Adolf Hitler wrote to Grant, said, this book is my Bible. So we, we, we know what happened to Hitler. It also promoted the idea that they can bring black Africans to America and show them as in between species. And so that's what happened with Otto Binger in the Bronx Zoo. They brought him there so that they could show that he was in between. Darwinism spawned the belief that some races were physically closer to the lower primates and were also inferior. The view was the blacks evolved from the strong, but less intelligent gorillas than, than the orientals from the or orangutans and from the whites and the most intelligent of the primates, the chimpanzees. So we, we get the idea that the black African was lower than the white man. And that was kind of pushed. It was really not kind of, it was pushed by Charles Darwin. So keep that in mind. Now, um, Madison Grant, the fellow I showed you before that wrote the book, Passing the Great Race, he's responsible for getting, for ensuring Otto Binger's place in the Bronx Zoo that ended awfully. Uh, he, a few years later, he committed suicide. 
He was brought to this country and really had no idea where he was, what he was doing. He was completely brought out of his culture and left to stay here. And it was very difficult for him to adjust. Even there were ministers that tried to help him. Uh, he, was, he, was not, he was not just part of it. He felt very out, out of sorts here. So we, we get the idea that this what? idea of racism. Huh? Okay, all right. Enough of that. I'm, ju I'm just trying to see if you're awake or not, folks. Okay, so we had the Scopes trial in 1925. I don't know if you know this, but the Scopes trial in 1925, uh, the book that they were using well, believed in this kind of stuff. They believed in uh, that they had the transitional forms. It was right a little bit after Ernest Heckels were working, but a lot of people thought that there was a transition and that transition led to where we are today, where, well, where there's racism. And, and, and of course, we understand that the best answer to racism is what the Bible says. There's one blood, there's one race. We all come from God and created in his image. End of conversation. Is that the second commandment is we're to love our brother as ourselves. So we, we understand this. We, we understand that we're one and there's differences. We can understand those differences because the Bible tells us there was there was a uh, a, a curse that took place because man was uh, he was taking over he was he, being himself again thinking his own thoughts doing his own thing thinking he was king and forgetting about God the Creator and Redeemer and as a result uh, there was a curse the Tower of Babel took place and now we have isolated areas where people now have different cultures and different that's because of the Tower of Babel. Okay, so we see this. Now, that's the history. I want to bring you a little update now. Uh, I want to update you in the controversy, okay? So we're going to talk about the controversy today, and I'd like to show you some differences. So this is the second part. So we have a human origin fantasy. What's the origin fantasy? It says this. There is a deep-seated uncertainty about human origins by science, scientific experts. Okay, so if I said to you, we're going to begin to study about human origin, you know, the ape, ape man and supposedly what evolution believes about human origins. The first thing I'm going to say to you is that there's a deep-seated uncertainty, period, about human origins. Okay? Second, paleontologists cannot agree on a set theory because it keeps changing. Now, I've been in this area since... Uh, I became a Christian and started the organization. And I've been reading a lot of stuff. I get tired of reading it. Do you know why? It keeps changing. The models keep changing. I, well, I think, well, maybe they're, no, no, we've got, another, we've got another model. And I love this one. And typically the theory is illustrated with fanciful drawings of cavemen or human actors wearing heavy makeup. We know about this, don't we? Um, this, by the way, was stated by Jonathan Wells in Icons of Evolution. I love that book. He, he, he just summarizes it. It's so good. So I thought I'd bring it to your attention. Uh, have you ever seen this one? This was on TV. I don't know it was called Walking with the Apes. How about this one? How about that guy? <laughs> How about this one? Okay, so makeup does a lot, right? You can dress anything up. You can make it real and so on. But how about this thing? How about the chart? How about the evolutionary chart? The evolution tree of man. And you can see, um, you can see right here, here, here is a, they say that this happened 25 million years ago, where all of a sudden these, this key monkey are separated and we have the great apes here and the old world monkeys, okay? And then we come up here, the great apes, and then we have the division and all, the, here, here, here's, the, here's the point now where everything started to change. The last common ancestor, humans had chimpanzees lived, Eight to six million years ago, we do not yet have its remains. <laughs> Hello, we don't have its remains. I see, they, at least they admit it. All this is fake in here. Okay, and there you are sitting right next to the champ, champ, chimp, chimps. <laughs> so, uh, chimpanzees, there you are. And, uh, you know, we're supposed to be related to them. So, I need to let you know that this is kind of a creative thing, okay? Many of you might doubt it just by looking at it. Where, who put the lines there? Well, those lines are put by, as, as Jonathan Wells mentioned, put there by the creation of man. He put them there. Man put them there. They made the connections. 
So uh, let's talk a little bit about fact. How many fossils do we have? Well, let's go to the American Museum of Natural History where we were before at the exhibit there. By the way, I came from New York City. I, so did Steve, we passed Steve. I lived in Brooklyn and I, I went to this museum a lot. Uh, this is right off Central Park. We took the train, we went up there, got to see the dinosaurs, all those beautiful things. But Ian Tutso, Tutso, the curator of the anthropology and the American Museum of Natural History in New York, admits you can fit all the human fossils into the back of a pickup truck if you didn't mind how much you jumbled everything up. So right off the bat, I'm coming to tell you that the number of fossils that prove that we came from apes is very, very small, okay? That's the controversy. And so they can fit up the back of that pickup truck. Oh, I'm sorry, I pressed the horn. I didn't mean to do that. Okay, sorry. <laughs> okay, so uh, is the study of human origin scientific? Well, how many number of specimens in question do we have? Well, the primary evidence pitifully, uh, a pitifully small array of bones, which to construct man's evolutionary history. One anthropologist has compared it to the tax to re reconstructing the plot of war and peace in 13 randomly selected pages in science. So ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce you to Leo Tolstoy. And he wrote The War and Peace. It was about, it was the end of the uh, 1800s and so on. It's when Napoleon went to Russia, 1,225 pages. So. What this anthropologist is saying is that you have 13 pages out of that book randomly. And now you gotta find where they go with that, that big book at 1,225 pages. Now I can show you example after example. Actually, I'm gonna quote a few more things so you can see them. So here is an observation uh, made by Bill Bryson, a short history uh, of nearly everything, <laughs> of nearly everything. I love this book. And he found that, hey, there's a problem here. Uh, he said a big part of the problem, paradoxically, is a shortage of evidence. So again, we don't have hardly any evidence that this is true, that we are related to apes. Since the dawn of time, several billion human or human-like beings have lived Earth, contributing a little genetic variability to human stock. Out of the vast number of the whole understanding of human prehistory, is based on the remains, on the remains. How do we know about a past? Check our remains, okay? We're, we're beyond the written language now. We have to go back. As Christians, we check our his, historicity on God's word because that always remains. That will never go away. And so Bill Bryson says fragmentally of perhaps 5,000. And when he says 5,000, don't think of full skeletons. I'm taking, uh, he's stating 5,000 little trinkets, bones, little bones here, little bones there. That's what he's talking about. Okay, keep that in mind. So discussing this, I find that as we discuss this, these kind of missing link stories uh, is based on very little information. Okay, now I'm gonna, this is perspective. I have a fake skeleton there. This is perspective of a one who believes in the Bible and believes about Noah's flood. Human bodies have a low fossilization potential. That's true. We blowed up, we float up, it, especially if we're drowned in water, we become, our remains become easily dislodged and, and so on. Human population that died in the flood, Noah's day is estimated to be about 350 million people, okay? Even if you were preserved and evenly distributed throughout the 350 cubic miles of flood sediments, the chances of exposure, discovery, and recognition and reporting of even one human fossil would be extremely remote. I want you to keep that in mind. That's why I believe whatever we're finding, they call them human remains, are probably, most probably, things that happen after the flood. So, the fossil record is bare. Scientists can see that even the most cherished theories are based on the embarrassing few fragments time. The, the human fossil record is short and scant, scientific American. The entire hominid collection known today would barely cover a billiard table, New York's new scientist. 
In all the world, there are only a few dozen, but these rare fossils attest to the evolutionary odyssey that created in the human species, that created the human species. So ladies and gentlemen, we don't have enough evidence in the small fragments we have. I'm gonna share with you what we've done in digging dinosaurs up. And you're gonna see that we have to have more evidence to be able to make these creatures. It's, it's like, you gotta have enough to be able to draw a good picture of what's going on. When one bone, it's not enough, or three or four bones, or even 20%. Mr. Yenethal in 1960, this is Chicago, Chicago Museum. Uh, I picked up a friend's book many years ago. Uh, he was uh, teaching with me. He went to Princeton University. This is a picture out of his book. This is 1960, his geology book. They were talking about Neanderthal. This appeared in the Chicago Field Museum and occupied a complete two-story wall, okay? And they painted this saying, this is Neanderthal. They based it on a skull that had, a skull, I mean, a skeleton that had rickets and it was a man in a cave, okay? Uh, here is the, here's more of the painting. Shows him walking around and even has a mate, okay? Took the privilege of doing that. We know that we can make, we can manufacture whatever we want. Uh, and that's what he basically did. They found out in 1954 that that was a fallacy. I mean, yeah, 1954, they found it was a fallacy. And that really, when they rechecked it, they realized that the man had rickets and that's why he was stomped over. He looked like a fairly human skeleton. So what, here, here's a, here's a uh, in Science 81, that's Mr. Neanderthal. I put this up when I was teaching one year and the kid said, that's our substitute. So, I mean, that looks human, right? And he did look like the substitute. <laughs> uh, 1968 to where we are now. So Neanderthal has really changed, hasn't it? And we see this with a lot of things that with anthropologists have been picking up. Here we are. Here's Neanderthal, and here he is today. They now say Neanderthal intermarried with Homo sapiens, which is us. So it's absolutely crazy. This is when I when I was going to school many years ago. They were special creatures. They were walking around. That was the ape man kind of thing. It was a missing link. Okay, there's a beautiful little girl hugged by a chimpanzee. Do humans descend from brute animals? Okay, there is no birth certificate for a fossil buried. This is true whenever you go fossil hunting. There's no date stamped on it. If you don't have a date, how do you know <laughs> where it came from? Or what year it came from? Or so on. It has no birth certificate, okay? There can, uh, cannot be connection made for ancestry because of intervals of time. There are millions of years from one generation to the next. Six million years, supposedly, we started to come become a man. That's where the separation was. Well, there's a lot of time in there. So where do you put it? You got plenty of time, plenty of space. I have news for you. You can play over here, put it over there. Each fossil found, found is an isolated point that floats around an overwhelming sea of gaps. I want to show you these gaps, they're amazing, okay? The, the conventional line of descent and ancestry is completely a human invention created after the fact. So let's go back to that chart we showed in the beginning. See it over here? Okay, so take a look at it. I told you right in behind, see they admit that we don't have these guys, right? But they don't admit that they don't have enough of these guys, you see this? because the fossil record is incomplete. So there's no, yeah, no birth certificates, right? Okay. Uh, there's no um, ancestry because of the intervals of time. How do you make the connection? Could this one connect, be connected to that one? I'm not, you know, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> there's this big gap of time. I mean, we got millions of years separating these guys. And then of course, the fossil floats around in the gaps. So we can be moving around anywhere you want, millions of years, and a lot of white space here. You see that white space? You can do a lot of moving around. Okay, and the last one was this one, a human invention created after the fact. So that's why you put them anywhere you want. Oh, I think I got it now. No, you don't, how do you know? Uh, I, I love the idea, but you ever put a puzzle together? I mean, one of those 100 piece puzzles, 
Don't you need a picture to follow? <laughs> I mean, just imagine trying to put that puzzle together without a picture. You get the picture, you look at it. This is what it's all about. But if you don't have a picture, you get this for your grade. Sorry, <laughs> it, it fails. Now, let me talk to you about fossils because we've done dinosaur fossils. And we've hunt dinosaur fossils. When I took these crews up from CSI, we had a lot of fun. You dig this? This is in uh, in Montana, and it's in uh, in an area. Uh, Glen Dive is the area, and is called Hell Creek Formation. That Hell Creek Formation is part. Of, we find a lot of dinosaurs in there, Stegosauruses and things like that. Everywhere. Uh, we, in this case, we found um, we found Triceratops. So we're finding dinosaurs in there. And so uh, that's our group hunting fossils. Now, if you've ever been to a fossil site, it's very interesting because what you're told in books is not like what it's in the fossil site. Because you have to like chip away, chip away very carefully before you can get anything. So you chip, 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 sorry. And you chip, 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 and you, 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 you hunt your fossil. So um, while we're chipping away and hunting our fossil, this is what we found. This is a close friend of ours, Dr. Uh, Dr. Scott was here with us. Uh, and he literally found this T-Rex tooth, Dr. McCohen, Dr. Scott McCohen was with us. And he, he found this T-Rex tooth. You see that? That's a large T-Rex tooth. Now it's one of the smaller ones, by the way, but it's pretty large too. You don't have teeth like that. But that's a pretty, that's kind of a smaller T-Rex tooth. Now, right next to it was a piece of a turtle scoop. Let me show you the turtle scoop. You see the turtle scoop right there? You see it? Well, that turtle scoop is what we find in the Peace River. It's modern day turtle. turtle. Now, if you were digging in that site and you found that thing with the T-Rex uh, T Rex tooth, that state is supposedly 65 million years old, guess what date that, that, Turtle scoop would get as part of a turtle shell. What would they get? 65 million years. What? It's got to be all the same. Well, they changed the date. They may even change the name of the fossil. So you have to understand when you're dealing with this kind of digging these fossils up, you're going to get lots of different things that come at you. And a lot of them, believe it or not, are modern day fossils. How about Time Magazine? Saw this in Chicago airport in 2006. It blew me away. It says how we became human, all right? How we became human. And of course they talked about the idea that we are so close with our DNA to chimpanzees. So everybody was getting calls, how come, you know? Well, chimps and humans share almost 99% of their DNA. New discoveries reveal how we can be so alike um, I show this picture to my students, high school, college. We're not really science oriented. And they said to me, that's crazy. They said, how could that monkey look like a baby and it's 99% check DNA? There was something crazy about this. So, uh, you know, the idea that chimps and humans share almost 99% discoveries reveal how we can be so alike and yet so different. So this is what they wrote. This was the idea, the, the whole idea of the article. As scientists keep reminding us, evolution is a random process in which haphazard genetic changes interact with random environmental conditions to produce an organism somehow fitter than <laughs> its fellows. Do you understand what they're trying to say to us? haphazard processes, random processes. I mean, th is this scientific? I go in my lab and say, okay, let's throw everything up and let's see where it happens today. No, actually you have to be so finite and so uh, refined, I mean, we're finite, but so refined in what we're trying to do that we have to get specific. That's why we have science. You do careful measurements, you move things up. You don't randomize anything. I mean, this is crazy. I mean, I know there's statistics, you can gamble, you can play, play, you know, dice, you can do a lot of things. But in science, it's contrary to science. Science deals with what can I, let me just check this out. There's laws that they have to follow. 
there it gets rid of this kind of randomness and so here's talking about randomness then is this a scientific statement come on well as time went on we found something different what they forgot to tell you okay the human genome was uh, was used to guide a framework to anchor and orient the chip sequence in other words we had exposed in 2000 the human genome 3.2 billion base pairs all laid out all the code all laid out then, then a chip at that time was not finished when they published the time article so they didn't have the full genome or the chips dna so how can they make a fair comparison they didn't make a fair comparison we also looked at this these regions were cherry picked because they already showed similarity in some level in the same level so if they saw a pattern of what's going on with the data the way it looked they would put it right next to the human and that's how they fit so they kind of maneuvered the data they cherry picked it several studies have been performed where target regions of the genome were compared in overall similarity estimates low is it's 86 percent were obtained and i think i've seen data even lower than that so we see that the chain the chimp genome is 10 to 12 percent larger than a human genome so when they finally got the chimp genome together it was larger than a human genome we're 3.2 million so you have to take 10 to 12 more percent of that and you can get an idea how much larger that's going to be and therefore it was an inaccurate study but yet they went on their false conclusions and told us that we looked like that we were 99.99 uh, of the dna matched a chimpanzees my wife said to me this is good logic she said if it's that close why don't we see them there should be a chimpanzee sitting next to you in the airplane when you travel I mean, really and truly, that was kind of, but interesting, interesting enough. I have a, another little thing. This came from the Creation Mag Magazine, Creation Ministries International. This article was really neat. Very little humans. So Robert Sabreth and Dorothy Cheney, after 30 years of field observation on monkeys and baboons, concluded severe limitations on intelligence and communication in monkeys. That meaning that you go from one monkey to another tribe or you go to another species of monkey okay another because monkeys have different species they literally did not communicate very well you would think that they were similar they should be able to communicate you know so using the dna code this leads to the conclusion that few percentage points leads to vast unbridgeable gaps between the species so even then even with small percentage points there's differences so as we look at the controversy, it doesn't look very appealing for ape to man. Actually, we don't have that transition we need. So how do you find a missing link? part three? How, how, when they go out, what do they look for? Well, to start this part, I want to tell you that one of the most important things is you got to see what a man is. So here's a human being defined in evolutionary terms. What's a man? He's got a brain. And his brain size, his big brain. Okay. Second, he has to be, have the ability to use tools. He's got intelligence, he's creative, he can use those tools. Okay. And then he's got to have uh, detonation. It has his mouth. His mouth look like a human. That's important. Okay. We can do a human. And his ability to walk upright. So if he walks upright, oh, you got something close to a human. Okay. So if you were studying to be an anthropologist to go out and get those fossils these are the things that you're going to be looking at and it's kind of i think it's neat to know because you're going to find out that that's a failure too well let's take a look look at brain size for instance okay so um they tell us human evolution used the progressive brain size to prove evolution of a man so rationale the bigger the skull the more intelligent you are this picture kind of i got this from a um old old textbook and uh i love it i mean you, it's very picturesque i don't believe it of course but they have all this australopithecus has a small skull and then you get dome erectus and then you get neanderthal i told you they had them separated but now they're the same and a modern man okay 
So what do we have? Sorry, what do we have in front of us? We have this. What's brain size? Well, okay, make sure I'm going in the right order. Okay, brain size. Eugenics is a study that separates humans into groups according to their evolutionary traits. Skull size and shape was part of the eugenics movement in the late 1800s. Actually, you, they were measuring people's skull when they got off the boat in Ellis Island. That was part of the way they did it. This is, and when in the early 1900s, part of the eugenics movement, they were looking at traits and preserving those traits by what? By judicial marriages. In other words, you would stay with your own kind of, you would try to marry up, not marry down. Okay. Of course, that's part of Darwin's theory the, the weak, uh, the strong shall survive. And what happens to the weak? They, they go, they're gone. Okay. So normal human brain size was wide variance. What do you mean by that? Well, let's take a look. You can measure skulls and you have 800 cc's to 2,200 cc's. Yes, some people have a big head. You can go to a hat store and find that out yourself. <laughs> In your house, you might have people have big heads. I mean, physically, okay? They can have big heads. And so we have a 400 so cc difference, female size of 1,300 cc's. And males um, are 1,400 cc's. Males, that doesn't mean you're smarter. Remember, brain size doesn't matter here. <laughs> It just means built, that's all it means, okay? So the human brain, brain size, okay. Brain size has never been linked to intelligence. Variation with a thousand cc's has never proven increase or decrease in intelligence. How is intelligence linked to the brain? Uh, it's still a great scientific mystery. I repeat, how is intelligence linked to the brain? It's a scientific mystery. That, that is, I believe, God's way of telling us that we're finite and he's ingrained upon us. You know, uh, our heart is how our heart's up here. <laughs> so when we receive Christ, we believe in Christ. The Holy Spirit works in us. It's going to be up here. The heart's just a muscle. But this tells you the mysterious brain and how it works. Um, it's hard to pin down what makes humans' brain exceptional among mammals. Neither brain size, relative brain size, nor no, number of neurons is unique to humans. And that's from Scientific American, and that was just fairly recent. That's a good idea. So conclusion. Conclusion. The, evolutionary, the evolution of man has never been verified with brain size. Okay? Very important. So the human distinctive is the intelligence. That's one of our instinctives. We are very intelligent. We can problem solve, we can learn things, not just by memory, but we can solve things. We can you know, work on putting words together and creating newer things. So man has so many unanswered questions about the brain. It is the most mysterious organ created and as well the most complex physical structure in the universe. And who said that? Isaac Asimov, that's who said that. So practically nothing is known about the way the information processing actually takes place in the brain. We have an idea, but we've got a long way to go. Nobody knows how perceived semantic information is derived from incoming electrical signals. Electrical signals going through our brain. These neurons are firing all the time, creating pathways. That's a, that's a mystery in its own self. We have our own distinctives. One of them is intelligence. Uh, we also have created in God's image. Um, the word created in Genesis 127 is used three times. I love the way he said, I, um, and man is created in God's image. In the image of God, he's created. He created him, male and female. He created them. The word image is used two times. The word create is used three times in that verse. You notice our identity is not only wound up in the image of God, but also being male and female. Intelligence, language. Creativity, I call these uniquenesses, gifts from God to make us who we are. The, what David says, we are uh, higher than God is mindful of us because he's created, created us with honor and glory, more, more consciousness and emotional death. Unbelievable things that are important. So as we look at the idea of trying to find fossils or what they look for in humans, 
Well, they found this little guy, uh, bones, uh, not yet fossils of Homo floresiensis, to give it its scientific name, has been discovered 203 by a group, 2003 by a group of scientists at the Laying Bohau Cave in the island of Flores in Indonesia. I love this one. You want to see what they found? That's the skull in the middle. The skull on the side here, on this side, let's see if I can point to it, this side right here, right here. That's Homo erectus, okay? And that's the Jung skull, okay? So you get the size. Look at this little guy, okay? So as we look at comparison brain size, we see that chimpanzees are 383, orangutans 404, and then gorillas are 4, uh, 505. And look at Homo florensis, 420. Where do we put him? <laughs> yeah, but he's considered, after some thought, and this was discovered in 2003, we had all these theories coming out. Today, they say that he had modern man's intelligence. They checked the inside. And notice they had all the lobes that a human mind, I mean, a human brain has. And they concluded that he was intelligent. So what do you look like? Well, this is kind of an idea. <laughs> he is a third of the size of man. Very small, a third of the size of man. Bones were not fossilized. They were like mashed potatoes. Unearthed bones of 14 other individuals were found in that site, in that cave. The study of the skull of the brain case was like a human with a small head. Dwarfism is proposed presently. They also found dwarfism in the mammoths they found, in elephants they found. There were dwarfs on that island. And they believe that because that island was so separated that these people intermarried and their genes were, it, the dwarf gene was a major gene. It was the dominant gene as a result. A lot of dwarfism, they believe, was an island. That's theory, it's floating around. Okay, so the hominid, they call it the hominid. Uh, homo fluorescent because that's such a small skull. Neither would anyone have guessed that a creature that has a skull the size of a grapefruit might have possessed cognitive abilities capable to those of anatomically modern humans. Kate Long, Scientific American. That's true today. That's what most scientists agree with today, that that had human intelligence. They found tools on the side too. Uh, a forearm bone was found deeper in the same site, a modern average size human. Uh, some of the fossils found were from pygmy elephants, Komodo dragons, and a giant rat, like we see today, okay? Well, well giant rat, <laughs> but rats, okay? And, and, and uh, elephants, okay, they were pygmy elephants. So it looked like there was something going on in that island, and they were finding these creatures that were unbelievable, okay? So modern day tools, I put that up there because guess what? If you find tools, um, humans use tools, everybody uses tools. Um, and so when they find tools, they say, okay, there's a human here. Nope, they say it could be a transition because of human tools. Well, I look at tools and I think it takes intelligence, right? We went over intelligence, it takes creativity to make a tool. So that would signify to me that it was human, all right? Walking tall, okay? Man has a unique ability to walk upright in order to talk upright. A human must have special designated vertebral column supported to give a balance to the body. So now we're talking about, you know, the walk. How do they walk? Do they walk stooped? How do they walk? Well, we know that humans have this kind of curve in our back and supports our weight. Okay, supports our head, supports our... If you take a look at a human, a human is not supposed to stand straight. Why? He's like an upside down brooms, okay? So all the weight's up here. So how does a man stand up? How does he able to stand straight? Guess what? He's got inside his ear, near the cochlea, he's got a semicircular canal. And these semicircular canals right in here are what keeps us straight. The brain processes that and they're little made in those tubes. They have these little hard substances made of protein that move around and the senses inside your station tubes are able to sense left, right, where you're supposed to be. So that's the most important thing. If you have trouble with your station tubes, you can fall. There are people that have a disease that associates that and they, they're able to fall, that they will fall. 
So standing upright has a lot to do with anatomy and physiology. Not so much, the, 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 there's some th degree of anatomy in that situation, but humans standing up straight is because we are, we are built that way. It's by design. And when I look at a human, I see God all over. I mean, who would think of mutation tubes in that little area, semicircle tubes that keep you erect? Unbelievable. Okay, so what did they find? There is Australopithecus. He was the one that was going to make it. He was going to one that's going to find out standing straight. So I want you to see right off the bat, does this guy have any hands? Does he have any feet? The answer is no. So if you have to have this guy standing up, you got a problem. We got no feet. <laughs> how do we know how we walk? Well, they went around and around. So uh, here's a new picture of him. <laughs> I found in my research. Here he is. There he is. And they made it out of this little out of this. And that's not even that. I, I got that. Uh, I got permission to use that, but that's not the best one. The best one is less than that. Um, so here, here it is. It's three and a half feet tall. It walked on its knuckles. This is a small fragment in many pieces. Skull was in fragments everywhere. At the site, they had thousands and thousands of bones. Pick and choose what, which ones are going to have. Okay. Uh, Lucy uh, finds only 20% of full. Uh, so Johansson says it's 40%. No, it's only 20%. It's even less than that. Okay. Knee bones found 200 feet below. He's making a big thing about this knee bone. What's 200 feet below that? Then we look at it walked uh, and, and with a stoop, stoop gait. It had to, from what we could see. Okay. Uh, walked on its knuckles like a monkey. Now, I got to tell you something. We went to the American Museum of Natural History, my wife and I, and I brought it to the area where they had the ape to um, man de demonstrate um, exhibits. And as we're walking around, I told her that these exhibits were made from New York people. In other words, New York City people model these exhibits. So she better close her eyes because they're all new. Okay, that's true. What they did is they had the, they had Lucy in that case, in there, and they had these footprints, the Laotoli footprints, and they imagined Lucy was walking with, or there was, if I remember, there was there was two of them, and they were walking, and they left their footprints behind, and the footprints got completely. We found out those footprints were were human footprints; they weren't the, the old footprints, so they had to get rid of the whole exhibit. <laughs> they put it up. And then we came back again and they re rebuilding the, the human anthropology area again. So I was laughing. See what I'm saying? There's very few evidences of it. And so in a college textbook, I love this. In a college textbook, uh, I found this. This is uh, an older college textbook. It was mine when I went to college this year. Um, an admission in, to difficulty. Australopithecus are assumed by evolutionists to be related to humans and therefore are called hominids, okay? Very few have been found. Okay. Many of our fragments are excess of 30 p 300 pieces in the skull. Remember, I told you the skull was not very good. It is like putting together a three-dimensional pig. Now, I mentioned a one-dimensional jigsaw puzzle. Imagine trying to put a three-dimensional one together. Okay. Missing pieces without, without a picture. Okay. Uh, it's extremely heterogeneous group with males larger than females. Okay. Right. And then lastly, to me, it was a monkey. That's what I think they found. Intensely compelling under, undertaking predisposed to a claim. In other words, this there's something funny about this. So as we conclude, I go back to the scripture. We looked at the history, how Darwin influenced and how it brought into racism. The next thing we look into is the fact of the controversy, where they try to make relationships like DNA. They, they try to tell us that we come and we look in this fossil record, there's no fossils could really talk about this. The third thing is when they find these discoveries, looking for what man's supposed to be, it turns out to be completely wrong. So I come to you today and tell you, as we conclude, that we are wonderfully made. And I believe King David put it in such a beautiful way. And I like to end it off this way as we conclude. Even the darkness is not dark to you, 
The night is bright as the day, for, dark, for darkness is light to, with you. For you formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden uh, from you. When I was being made in the secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed substance in your book, uh, in your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me when as yet there was none of them. How precious to me are your thoughts, O oh God. How vast is the sum of them. When I look at that scripture, I can't help it, but I see God's in, unbelievable work on us, how we're individually made with our, in, in with our traits and so on, that our frame was not hidden from God. It was there in front of him. He, the word, I love the idea of written in the book, the idea of the genetic code and being put together by him and not letting anything go because he is a God of detail. That's what we found last, last month when we discussed the last session, the dispensable evolution, we got to see the God of detail. Uh, first, when we saw that God had a purpose, he didn't create by accident. Everything came with a purpose, a magnificent purpose. And here we are, the crown of his creation. So I thank God that we are so wonderfully made that we can experience him, that we can actually experience God. My dog can't experience him. Our animals can't experience him like we can because we're built to have a relationship with him. So as we enter, I'm just going to review the, if you don't have this, it's a great resource. The Dismantle, um, we've set a whole series on this. So please keep that in mind. And also the book that I wrote, uh, Evolution is Fatal Fruit. Now, Darwin, uh, Darwin's Tree of Life brought death to, brought death to millions. So uh, thank you so much for your attention. Um, I give God praise. So we're going to end the session. Johnny, I'm going to turn it over to you.